specifically we'll be talking about the mental health of black women and how it's viewed differently. Jeanette, did you want to start with questions? I have my own as well. Okay, I do have a question, if I can, if I may. Yeah. Being that we are African American women and knowing that we have been under this stigma of all all black women are angry, all of us are always mad. Um, and anytime we answer a question, it sounds like we're mad. So for instance, <clears throat> I don't have a soft tone type of voice where I speak like this and you know, the grass is greener on the other side. No, I'll say the grass is greener on the other side and someone may think that I'm angry. How, how would you deal with that? Either one of you, how would you deal with that? Because we have a different type of tone, I think, of our voice and that different way of expressing um, the same answer. That makes sense. That does make a lot of sense. I think I pay attention to tone in some ways. So I, I know that a lot of times I get on the phone and someone says, well, you know, you sound like a guy. So my, my voice apparently is a lot more deeper and mass than I thought it would be. And, but yeah, I'm over the phone. And usually I don't correct people. I'm like, well, hey, I'm going to live in privilege for this moment. <laughs> so let's just play with it. I'm going to go ahead with this. You can just see whatever you want to see. When I'm in face-to-face -face situations, um, it is tricky uh, because, you know, I, I do see, I do feel as if, if I'm in meetings and I'm with other people, um, how am I going to be perceived? Um, should I not say anything because, you know, just wait till everyone else says something or if I talk first, is it going to be perceived as aggressive or confrontational because I'm, and a lot of times I, I, I am the, the kind of person kind of just talk first, kind of get my thoughts out there. Um, but I think it's, I think it's tricky. I think it's really tricky to kind of deal with, um, with that. But then I also think that it's not just how I am, carrying myself and how I'm presenting myself, but it really is the other person and their perception of what I'm saying. And they already bring these perceptions, they already bring these ideas to the meeting way before I even open my mouth. And so I try to kind of think about both of those things as, I'm, as, as I kind of navigate uh, talking in meetings. I agree, it, it definitely can be challenging. Um, I think my experience um, as an African American woman, and as a, a, a tall African American woman as well, um, I know that when I'm in a meeting or when I come into a room, um, and I've had people tell me uh, right off the bat that I have a very strong presence and um, I'm intimidating, um, even before I speak, I'm already considered to be uh, a threat to uh, people. And I know from my own experience and especially working in the mental health field, I understand that um, the angry black woman kind of concept is used as uh, a kind of way to, to silence and shame me, uh, to keep from actually standing up and saying what I'm feeling or um, what I need and uh, to convey the message that I think is important um, to say. Um, I have definitely found that challenging. Um, I don't want to lose who I am uh, in the process, uh, but sometimes I do feel like I have to alter myself uh, in order to make other people feel comfortable with me in the room. And it really shouldn't, it's not my responsibility to make others comfortable with me. Um, so it, it, it has been, uh, even at, at work, it, it, it's, it's challenging to kind of balance the two and to still be true to yourself um, as well. Um, because again, I do have um, uh, that a strong voice. Um, I can be considered, oh, you know, it, come across as aggressive when really it's just a, a matter of being confident. Uh, in myself and 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 what I have to say, so um, you know it can be very challenging. Uh, absolutely, I think it's interesting that and a part of this comes to the, this idea of code switching, mm -hmm. because when I'm around my family and around my friends, in some ways I'm not 
I don't appear strong enough or I don't appear like, you know, so you want to make sure it's, it's important that I find to kind of maintain those ties to the community and at the same time um, present this idea of what being professional is about. And so I'm, I'm constantly kind of straddling both of those worlds and where, okay, here's, here's what I, how I present myself at work. Here's how I present myself in these more personal spaces. And I think in both kind of spaces, I, I don't think I'm, it's hard because like, okay, I'm not doing, I'm not doing the best, you know, it's like, okay, well, you're not being, you know, you're not being like strong enough or black enough or whatever in these spaces. You're not using words that we would in the vernacular that we would use, you know, um, you're almost kind of whitewashed and, you know, in some ways. And then when I go to, you know, the professional setting, I was like, well, you know, then you're kind of intimidating. I've heard that intimidating thing. Mm -hmm. And to me, in light of everything that's going on, I don't, you know, I've, I've, my family alerted me to what's going on in the news. Um, and it's just because I try to stay away from it because it, it definitely gets me a little bit. I know I should be informed, but it really gets me angry. And my family, like, oh, here's what's happening. You know, here's what's going on in this, this week, last week, what's going on with the news and, you know, in these kinds of interactions with, with Black folks. And that idea of intimidation before you even meet someone, it's, it's a very scary thing. It's a very mm -hmm. scary thing. Um, Mary Tyxeria, uh, entered into the, uh, Zoom meeting a little later. I wanted to know if you wanted to also respond to Jeanette's question first. Um, I, I think age, I, I, I think I can safely say that I'm the oldest in, of the, the five people here. I've been around uh, a long time. Uh, I have made it a point to read Bell Hooks. Uh, Alice Walker, Maya Angelou, uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, you know, you get, um, there's something about knowing that you're right. And, and you, and I, I think about that line from a phenomenal woman, you know, from uh, Maya Angelou, she says, you know, she, she, uh, she walks like she's got oil wells in her backyard you know that that you walk with your head high and i think that comes from experience but also knowing you're right and once you know you're right hey, nothing can turn you around nothing you know i i was in a meeting with the president a few weeks ago um and he said something we were talking about the recruitment of african-american students because we only have about three percent african-american uh, of the whole student population about three percent are african-americans and when i arrived on campus uh over 25 years ago uh it was close to the 10 percent so we're losing african-american students and so we were kicking around some ideas you know going out and recruiting etc and then as he would, as we were packing up to go, and this was before his, his cabinet and, you know, a bunch of other people, there were about 20, 25 people in the, in the room. And he said, as he's packing up, just sort of casually, he said, uh, yeah, if, if we could just keep them away from gangs, uh, I think we could get more, more African-American students. And I don't know how you guys feel about that. But I just spontaneously said, that is extremely racist. Who that said is because we're talking about two different populations. But if you think that, that, uh, that we don't have black students because of the gang problem, then we'll never get more about black students if that's your attitude. And I, I, I have not regretted that one time. Of course, he was very, and he and his minions were very, um, uh, defensive. Oh no, we do have a gang problem in San Bernardino, but what does that have to do with recruiting black black students to campus, right? So, I, I mean, and I give that that uh, example just to say that I knew he was racist. I did not hold, you know, I'm I'm like you, Jeanette. If if I held it in, I would die. I mean, it's it's just. It's just to that point where I don't have tolerance for that foolishness anymore. And, I, and you know how old black women are. You know, they'll tell you the truth whether you like to hear it or not. And I, li I like the fact that I'm getting old simply because of that. I was so insecure in my 20s and 30s 
but the older I get, the the more confidence I have. I just wish I had this confidence when I was 20 instead of, <laughs> instead of how old I am now. But I love it. I love the fact that I, you know, of course I have tenure, I'm a full professor. Uh, and so I don't have to worry about those, you know, the, the, the what, what Marx called the, um, the, the dull compulsion of economic necessity. You know, I don't have to worry about that. And so that puts me in a much better spot. So I've had people on campus say, Mary, you go after them because I can't because I don't have tenure yet. I say, okay. Where you want me to go? Point me in the right direction, <laughs> you know? So, I, I mean, I think, and I appreciate Anika. Anika and I are colleagues. Uh, you know, you, you all have two sociologists on this, on this panel. And I don't know the rest of you, by the way. Can you, can you all sort of introduce yourselves? Um, if you could all please introduce yourselves. We'll oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm Hattie McNutt, and I work for Counseling and Psychological Services. Yay, Hattie. Thank you. Jeanette, how about you? I'm Jeanette Hazelwood. I'm a student. I am not a, um, what you call a traditional student. I'm a seasoned student. <laughs> That's what I like to call myself. And um, I'm with, uh, I'm an advocate, uh, uh, a student advocate with ASI. Fantastic, okay. fantastic. And how'd you get into this field, Jean uh, Yvette? Um, I'm a student as well. I'm the special projects coordinator at ASI, Jeanette is my colleague. Oh, great. Anika, did you introduce yourself? Oh, yeah. Anika, a fifth year assistant professor in the Department of Sociology. And, you know, uh, Mary, as you were talking, it made me think, you know, it's like, okay, people are like, no, you shouldn't be, you should not be angry. But I'm like, but why should I be? Have you seen the statistics? Have you seen what's going on? Everybody should be, not just me, not just black women, should be, everyone should be angry about the systematic inequalities, I mean, across all the different spheres. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I focus on a criminal justice system. Um, I know Mary, you know, you focus a lot on um, some of the things that's happening in the family, you know, um, and, and, and so it's just, there's a lot of things to be angry about. And I feel like anybody else's anger would be fine. I don't know why it's, <laughs> why, why we're not allowed to be angry, you know? Um, and so I find myself, when I am angry and I wanna present things and I am frustrated, I, I start with that first, but then I, I do find myself disarming people by, you know, by afterwards by trying to find them, make them comfortable about why I'm angry. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I need to do that or if I should do that. You know, it's um, not your job. That's not your job, Anika, to make people comfortable around you. And that's not any of our jobs. I, I'm not criticizing you. I'm just saying I want you to have the confidence to know that it is not your job to make people comfortable. I mean, I think Jeanette just said it. She said those, 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 I, I don't know exactly, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, those, those stereotypes of the angry black woman is used to keep us silent. You know, but my, I have been angry just about probably all of my life, but I found that my anger has, 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 um, uh, it has led me to where I need to go. You know, I could have very easily had a middle class, you know, regular life with 2.5 kids and a picket fence and all of that. Uh, but I made life difficult for me because I spoke up. And I have marched, I've been marching since I was 14 years old uh, against the Catholic Church because I went to Catholic school and uh, there were some things happening in the Catholic Church that I didn't like and that we didn't like, the girls in my high school didn't like. So we just, you know, caravan down to the chancery and in LA and, and we marched. And that was my first taste. That was my first taste of venting my anger. And, uh, and I, I loved it. You know, people don't, people don't respond to, to little miss nice. They really don't. They can ignore you. And that makes me wonder about, I have a, I have a follow up question for you, Mary. So you've been doing this for a while, marching and everything that in light of what's going on right now, do you think, do you still think that marching is a good tool for activists to use to mm -hmm. like really move? Mm -hmm. Sure. On social justice issues. 
Absolutely. Marching, but following up with policy, with changing. You know, I just came from the uh, Black faculty and staff uh, town hall, and we're talking about the same things. Uh, I am intolerant of police anymore. I think, you know, I've been in a lot of meetings through the years with, with police departments and have them, you know, with their little pink cheeks come in and say, you know, we, yeah, we're, we love the community and we're going to do this. Here's one statistic. 96% of police officers in the city of, of Minneapolis don't live in Minneapolis. Now, what does that tell you? Black folks have been saying for years that we feel like this is an invading army. Mm -hmm. And we see the result of that. Our boys, our boys and some girls are getting killed. And what are we being so nice about? <laughs> you know, how are we being, why are we being so nice about it? When, when, you know, it's desperation. I have a black son and he has to contact me every single day. So I'll know he's okay. And I've been, I've been crying all week. I can't get that man's, the picture of that man's knee on that, on that man's neck. If you, if you look at that and you don't feel something from that, then you don't have a soul. You just don't have a soul to see someone who looks like us saying, please, and and what's the last thing he said? He called for his mother. <laughs> he called for mama. <laughs> and mama couldn't be there for him. Well, I'm his mama. And I want to I, I wanna do everything I can to prevent this from happening. And part of the problem is that we send these police officers out in our communities. They send police officers out in our communities. And, and they tell them, do what you have to do to keep these animals down. And I, I you know, I'm, I've, I've seen this so many times, you know, those, those police officers who beat Rodney King, some of you have seen that, mm -hmm. that film, you know, they, they, four of them beat him, but, but 20 of them stood around and watched him getting beaten. And two of them, a black man and a white woman, reported it 18 of them did not we need to change that we need to change we need to change what policing is about we need to change the the concept of policing in this country so that we're not you know that they are protecting and serving and not not going out and acting like an invading army in our communities because we're you know we i know i know someone who was killed by the cops I know someone, I know the family, I know the kind of pain that the family is going through. You know, I, I just, I, uh, I'm, I'm angry. Yeah, I'm angry. And I'm proud of that anger. I think as a criminologist, um, I've really tried to uh, be a little neutral. I've tr I try to teach my students all sides. And I really try to um, think about how it's important in my position because when my mom and my sister, we, you know, they, we came here, they were having, we're having dinner. They came to my house, we're having dinner. And they said, have you seen what's been happening in the news? And I was like, no, actually I've turned it off for a good week. Cause I just, I just didn't want to deal with it. And apparently the week that I turned it off, <laughs> this is what's been happening. So my sister shared with me the video of the woman in um, Central Park and you know, what she was trying to do. And then my mom said, and by the way, here's this other video, like can you, what you mentioned before, Mary, of, of this black man getting his neck kind of, you know, and, and it's hard not to be angry. And I really started to think about, okay, well, as a criminologist, I try to be neutral. I try to think about these things, but at what point do you have to just say, you know what? I take a stand. I can't be neutral anymore. I'm angry about this stuff. I want to be neutral, but I can't. You know, you know my, my students know exactly how I feel, Anika. They know exactly how I feel. I give both sides. That doesn't mean that I don't give both sides, but they know what side, because they'll ask me, well, how do you feel about it? What do you mean? What do, what do you think? What do you think? And I think they respect you more because right. as somebody said, there's nothing in the middle of the road except yellow lines and dead armadillos. 
and, mm -hmm. and, and, and none of us can be, none of us can afford to be neutral or in the middle of the road because we're in, we're in crisis. We're in crisis. And we, you know, one of the reasons I got into sociology is because I felt like I could make a difference. And I think I have. Uh, my students, my former students are all out doing fantastic work. I had a, a student who was, who was a second grade teacher. And you know, the K through 12, the curriculum is really, really rigid. You know, where they, the, the principal walks in on a certain day, you better be in a certain module. But he said, he said, he said, Dr. Texera, and he's, he, uh, he, we were at a conference together, a meeting, and he comes and whispers to me and he says, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm educating some little revolutionaries in my second, in my second grade classroom. And, and you can do that. To teach a child to be a critical thinker is revolutionary because they want us to be regimented and they want us to obey. But if you teach a child, is that right? Well, think about this. Did Jack and Jill really go up that hill or, or did something else happen? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm being facetious now, but, but I think we can teach our children and, and, and take that all the way to the college classroom, to be critical thinkers, to, be, to always question authority. Because, you know, when we watch t nightly news, TV, the, the cops are the heroes, right? They're the heroes. So our kids come into the class. That's why criminal justice has, has so many majors. Because, uh, you know, they, everybody wants to be a cop. Everybody wants to be CSI. But uh, they're not heroes. They're not. We do not screen police officers for racism. We screen them for drugs. We screen them for criminal activity. But we don't screen them for racism. And so as someone who has mm -hmm. a history as being, being working in the police department, Mary, how do you struggle with what you have done back then, which I'm sure, you know, you, you had your reasons for exiting that profession. But like, how do you, how do you think about what you, what you did and experienced at that point in light of what's going on right now? I feel terrible. I, I, many of you don't, I mean, probably the other three people don't know, but I was a cop for 18 years. And so I know it from the inside out. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I feel bad. I, I mean, I don't think I ever did any, I, I, I flushed a lot of drugs, believe me. I was not taking you know, young black men to jail because th this is being taped, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the statute of limitations is over or what, <laughs> but, uh, but you, know, you, you, you just, policing is a very subjective occupation. They don't, they don't just go by the penal code, right? So I, I, I made the decision, you know, you're not going to jail. You're lucky you, you know, I came here. You are not going to jail today. So you need to go to school and do some other stuff. But I, my, my biggest regret is that I was so silent about some of the things that I saw. I never saw anybody getting killed, but I did see people being mistreated. Uh, I, I saw some really nasty things. Uh, and so that's what I regret. And, and that's one of the reasons I got out of the profession is because I wanted to, um, to take my activism in a, in a different place and, and you know, do a, go a different route. And thank you, um, Mary Tixaria, and thank you, Annika, for your contributions. Um, I really appreciated you both bringing up George Floyd today. We needed to honor that. Um, and it's Anika, I'm sorry, I have to correct you. Sorry. Anika, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for correcting me. Um, so Hattie McNutt is a counselor with CAPS, and I just wanted to um, ask your insight about the stereotype threat that Black women face and how it's affecting us psychologically now in the midst of a pandemic. Wow, stereotypes. Um, There are many stereotypes, actually, from um, not just from a black woman's perspective, but black people in general um, that, you know, I go over on a regular basis, especially when I have African-American um, uh, students or even in, in my own family. Um, let me just say, I've had many careers 
uh, leading up to, I call being a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, this is kind of my second act. This is my second half. I decided I wanted to do something new uh, and different uh, before my 50th birthday. So I went back to school to become a, a therapist um, at the age of uh, 45. And when I decided to do that, um, I didn't tell my family at first because uh, mental health is seen um, as something that we as African-Americans don't do. We don't engage in mental health at all. Um, that's for them and not for us. And there's that sense of, um, you know, fear and distrust in the mental health field. And, and rightfully so, because when you look at the history of the mental health field, uh, African-Americans were used as guinea pigs and experimented on in the worst possible manners from um, all the way to the Tuskegee experiment with African-American men and the syphilis to um, um, African-American um, women and men in um, insane asylums or, or particular um, institution that uh, were put there by family members to get help and unbeknownst to them, they were utilized uh, for some of the most horrific experiments um, ever. So there is a, a genuine distrust uh, with that as well. Now, from and crossing over into not just the angry black men, but uh, women, but um, African American women are, are considered to be um, very strong black women, very resilient um, uh, black women, and so and, and that's true. Uh, in many ways, we are very strong in, 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 in ourselves, but it's also utilized as a double-edged sword um, in many respects because um, it's used in a sense that it keeps us, because we're so resilient, we're less likely um, to um, utilize uh, mental health as an option to help ourselves. And so that becomes very challenging for us. There's a sense of shame and embarrassment, uh, weakness that goes along uh, with that as well. And we don't want to be seen that way. Um, as um, Black women tend to um, be the, the, the glue that keeps the families together uh, in some ways. They're the people that um, our children, our family, our communities come to um, uh, for their sense of, of reference, of support and stability and encouragement and all of those things, they take a lot onto themselves um, because of that strength and that resilience and the way that they are seen. Um, so uh, in that, they are less likely to, um, you know, they suffer in silence in, in many ways um, because of, of, of those kind of ways that they're um, expected to be. So it can be, it, it, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for me, even when I go and talk into the communities with African Americans and general African American uh, women, um, they don't want to um, be seen as sharing family problems or issues. They're very protective um, because African American women, they have many roles. They don't just have one role as just a woman. Um, as a wife, as a mother, they're the protector, they're the um, caregivers, uh, they're the providers, they're everything um, in, in, in a lot of our communities. So um, I, I think that it's that level of strength that, like I said before, it goes both ways, um, that kind of works against us. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to add on your own personal experience. I know some of my personal experiences um, even with my, my mother, um, when she was going through a, a grief, um, I tried to get her to go and talk to someone. And, um, you know, I know she's very strong in her faith. And she said the only person that she needs to talk to is God. And, and in so many ways, that's absolutely true. But it's that combination of how we bridge that gap between that faith and actually going to also talk to someone um, that may be um, specialized in that particular field that can help you as well. Um, so you're, she didn't want to be seen as um, that uh, weak in her faith with God and in her relationship with her prayer. 
and the prayer, the power of prayer. Um, so it, it gets a, a really challenging, not just with African American uh, women, but just in the African American community. Hattie, I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, this idea of this need to feel strong, but also the unintended consequences that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. I was reading a couple of studies, um, and I can send that to you later on. But one of them talked about the stereotype, exactly what you talked about, of a strong Black woman. Mm -hmm. And so it says, many Black women in America report feeling pressure to act like superwomen, depicting themselves as strong, self-sacrificing, and free of emotion to cope with the stress of race and gender-based discrimination in their daily lives. So it was this, it was this um, uh, researcher um, that was looking at um, African-American women's health, heart and health and health. They look at the kind of the links between those two. And she specifically um, um, talked to 208 self-identified African-American women uh, living in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area. So some of the results from the study um, really kind of showed a direct link between racial discrimination mm -hmm. and chronic uh, disease risk, kind of again, add to the literature that shows that the experience of racial discrimination alone, you know, taking, a, taking all the other stuff, all the other kind of, you know, variables aside, can be detrimental to one's health. Mm -hmm. Similarly, another st study um, that talks about the day-to-day -day experiences of emotional attacks among women and men of color in the workplace, um, finds that a majority of women of color, uh, specifically individuals who identify with Asian, Black, Latinx and multicultural backgrounds experiences emotional tax in their workplaces that affect their overall health. And so some of the findings from that research is this idea of this emotional tax, this, this um, burden levied on women of color, um, you know, to kind of, you know, be constantly feel on guard, constantly feel like they have to be on guard. Um, they have to, they feel like they have to outwork and outperform their colleagues. Um, and then this idea that um, despite being on guard, nearly 90% of women of color, you know, they still want to be influential leaders. They still want to, to face these challenges. They still want to do these things, but it still affects their health. And so even in light of the research that shows that this is damaging us and hurting us, taking all these roles, feeling like we have to be strong and, and strong for everybody around us, that's a lot. You have to be strong for our students. You have to be strong for our families. And then we are at the last of the list of people that need to be able to we take care of ourselves um, last, you know? And so that's really, really difficult. And um, I've, I've kind of pushed myself to, to, to check in and say, am I okay? Did I eat all day? Oh, I fed my daughter. Oh, I cleaned the house. Oh, I graded my students' papers. Did I actually eat anything at all? Oh, no, I didn't. I probably should. You know, and it's like, it's, it's, it's something as simple as not even allowing myself to eat because I have to put, I put everything else. And, and, and some of the, the report also talks about this idea of sleep deprivation. So this anxiety about what needs to be get done le you know, next and everything else and constantly thinking about people, um, you lose sleep. And it's not to say that we shouldn't because I feel like in an institution that we, we are at that's, um, that's, you know, Hispanic serving institution and us as faculty and staff members, it's important for students to feel like they should come to us. They want to feel, they want that representation. They want people that identify with. And I completely understand where they're coming from because that's what I gravitated to when I was undergrad. But it's still a lot. It's still a lot. <laughs> so it's kind of like, how do you deal with that work-life balance? And for me, I started to get to the point where I was like, you know what? I'm not going to answer emails over the weekend. Or I'm gonna give myself this one day to do nothing but watch mindless television or just to hang out with my kid. And so kind of finding these strategies to help us not burn out, I think is really important. Yvette, may I? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you so much, Hattie. You, you really put things in perspective. I, I, I appreciate that. There's, there's this, and, and um, Anika, by the way, can you send me that, the link to that yes. article? Yes, I'll send um, you the article. Yeah, um, the, there's a concept called weathering. I don't know if you've heard of it, Hattie, but it's it's the the microaggressions, the macroaggressions over a lifetime that uh, lead to all of these chronic diseases <laughs> such as high blood pressure, 
uh, alcoholism, overeating, all of that stuff, because, you know, we've got to be able to put that someplace. We've got to be able to have a, a, an outlet. And, uh, and, and I think for me, uh, thank you, Anika, I got it. Um, for me, it has been always in my life, I have had the support of black women. I have a very, very strong cohort of black professors, you know, you, and you can pr probably guess who they are because we don't have that many on campus. Uh, you know, but before the pandemic hit, you know, we were meeting on a regular basis. We went to movies, we went to plays, and we we bounced off of each other, you know, the the uh, the little slings and arrows we get every every day. And and I've always done that. I, I was educated by black women nuns. And if you can imagine what a, the stereotype of a nun, well, they were the stereotype on steroids. I mean, those women, <laughs> those women, what do you mean you can't do algebra? Yes, you can. Yes, you can do algebra. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, uh, I have always seen the value in, uh, in, in being around African-American women. My mother had five sisters. And all of those women were like my surrogate mothers. Uh, I have cousins. I have, uh, you know, friends in different places uh, who, who I I know who to call. You know, when for example, when when a particular thing thing happens, I know I can call Verna, who lives in Las Vegas, and she's going to tell me the truth. Right? She's gonna mm -hmm. she's going to tell me the truth. And that's who you want in your life. You know, you want those those black women who are strong and, and yes, we, we are, we've had to be strong. You know, uh, we, I think black single mothers are the biggest heroes there are. You know, we stay, black men leave for various reasons, you know, going to prison or just don't wanna be around to raise kids, whatever it is, but we raise our children. Sometimes people criticize us for the way we raise our kids kids, but that's okay. We stay. We stay. And I think we've got to realize that that takes strength to, like my mother, to come home and there's 600 hungry kids and you don't know what to feed them. My brothers had to go out and sell pop bottles to buy a loaf of bread, you know, because we were hungry. And my mother did, you know, she's a little farm girl from Louisiana, didn't have any kind of uh, education, job training. And, uh, and, and she, she was, you know, my father walked away when my little sister was three years old. He just didn't want to be a dad anymore. And never child support, no nothing. So, you know, my mother was, was my, is my hero, was my hero. And I, and I think we need to recognize that in each other and support each other mm -hmm. uh, and stop side-eyeing each other because sometimes we can be our own worst enemies. Yes. And, and just, and, and, and just uh, you know, help each other, just help each other. And it's hard because I, I don't want to make those assumptions. I think in, in, in my mind, it's the same weird thing where you, you know, you're on a street, you see someone else that's black, you're like, okay, give it a little nod, right? Mm -hmm. So, when I come to work, I'm like, ooh, there's a new faculty member of color. It doesn't matter, you know, what marginalized. I'm like, oh, let me just embrace this person. Let me talk to him about the struggle. Let me try to, like, help him navigate this, this, this field. And, but some people don't want to, they, they don't identify no. themselves as such. Yeah. Next. They don't recognize, <laughs> they don't recognize that, <laughs> that whether or not you identify yourself as such, other people are going to perceive you as such. That's right. So you, you really have to, you know, it, it's hard. It's hard to be able to, but I remember having that. I remember having one colleague come to my office um, from another department. I don't remember what she was, I don't remember, I don't know why she did it. I was happy that she did it. I mean, I guess it's the same idea that I would have, but she came to me and she said, you know what, we had this meeting, we had another meeting. She's like, you know, I felt like that white man in that meeting silenced you. And he didn't have, and she was just kind of, talking about, you know, like you need to speak up for yourself. You know, sure he doesn't think service is important. She was just telling me, she came in my office to tell me what she thought about this meeting and about how it's important 
to assert myself as a woman of color on this campus, not in a like scary, angry way, but like to really recognize that, yes, I'm a, I'm a privileged person in the fact that I do have a PhD and I am the tenant track position. Um, but she's like, at the same time, you cannot turn a blind eye to the things that make you disadvantaged. And that was a really important thing to, to I didn't was like, wow, someone actually said that. I, I can't believe someone said it. I thought it, but she actually came to me to say, you need to like, you need to be aware. <laughs> so, and I went, and I've been doing that to other people, maybe not subtle and, and not so subtle ways, but I've been trying to, I, I was like, you know, I heard her, what she said was important. I gotta do, I gotta pay it for it. And that's what I've been trying to do. But I've recognized that not everyone wants to take that advice. And they're not, they're not that part in their journey yet. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. Maybe years down the line, if it does become an issue, my door's still open, but we all got to take our own, our own steps, I guess. They'll see. They'll realize <laughs> one day they will. And, and I always tell people, you know, you, you, I, cause I try to nod my head or smile at every African-American student I see on campus. I mean, I smile at a lot of people, but especially African-American students, you know, I try to, you know, get under them, say, you know, raise your head up and walk around this campus like you own the campus, right? And sometimes they don't respond. And I feel like, it, you know, who's lost in that transaction? Mm -hmm. They've lost. I've put it out there. I've given them something and they didn't catch it. They didn't receive it. So, you know, next, I, that's and that's what you did, Anika. You, you know, you 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 reached out, and someone said, you know, I'm I'm gonna be okay. I don't need I don't need this. And every every job I've ever had, every organization I've ever been in, I've always tried to find the black folks. You know, is there a, is there a BSA on this campus? Is there, you know, a a, a black uh, black police organization? in this in this department i need to find um i need to find my tribe and i think you know we a lot of us go through life thinking we don't need a tribe um you know a friend of mine uh told my um my my son-in-law you know because he works in in uh wall street he they live in new york and he works on wall street you know he makes a lot of money but what does he have to give up you know, he he uh, he has to have his hair cut a certain way. He's got to wear a certain kind of suit. He's got to talk a certain way. And a friend of mine told him, "I bet you just can't wait home. Wait to get home to be black." And and he said, "You're you're right, because I can't be black. You know, for ten hours a day working on Wall Street." But mm -hmm. I, you know, I can't. And so as a result, he has no white music. He has no white pictures on his walls. You know, he's, he, he, he drenches him, himself in black because it's so important to him. He's, ra he's raised in black community in New Orleans. He owes the black community a lot for supporting him where, to be where he is today. And he knows that. And so he, he pays homage by listening to Coltrane or Miles Davis or, you know, Lil' Kim or whoever it is, you know, he doesn't have any white music in his house. And he, uh, he, you know, like I said, drenches himself in blackness. And I think that's sometimes what we need to do in order to arm ourselves for what we're going to encounter in the world. You know, because people don't, you know, we, they don't appreciate, you know, even some of us, we don't appreciate blackness. You know, we don't appreciate the kind of struggles that our ancestors went through in order to, so that we can all be sitting here in a Zoom meeting right now, right? Uh, you know, my grandfather could never have envisioned that his granddaughter would, would have been a PhD. Never, never. And yet, you know, some of us don't turn around and, and, and you know, the, the, the um, the motto of the black women's clubs was lifting as we climb. You know, so we're, you know, this is right out of slavery. We're, we're going to climb, but we get, you know, it's going to be a little bit slower because we're going to try and, you know, and, and, and take this burden, lift our own people. You know, he ain't heavy. He's my brother. He's my brother. And, and I think uh, that has, I, I mean, I don't, 
I don't know that I have ever articulated it quite like that, but that's essentially, you know, what we have to do for survival, not just to be nice, but for survival, we have got to be able to rely on each other. May I say something? It's about the fear of the, that black women having the, being in fear and having the mistrust and um, women being strong and resilient and suffering in silence. And me being a student and being the season, one of the seasoned students, I, when I see another student and I see that her shirt is too low, I have to make a comment because I think that's my child over there just walking with her boobs out. When I see one that the shorts is too short and their flesh is hanging out, their bottom cheeks is hanging out, <laughs> I have to share with them. You know, I understand you, you know, you want to do the fashion and all this other stuff, but when other things start to happen and you're getting the, the focus that you don't want, look at the way you're carrying yourself. And I'm not saying <laughs> not be black. I'm saying be, be respectful to your own self and not um, dress any kind of way. So I wanted to say this about being resilient and being strong. I've had two marriages. Both of my husbands had cancer. Both of them passed away. I felt like I had to be that strong woman, being that, excuse me, being that mother that my kids didn't, my children didn't suffer for anything. I worked two, two full-time jobs. And when I say two full-time jobs, I worked as a nurse. I worked my first job. I started from eight o'clock in the morning and got off at five. I started the second job at five in the evening and got off at eight o'clock in the morning. Mm. I worked 24 hours a day until my body just couldn't do it anymore. So I ended up with cancer. No one in my, mm. my family ever had cancer. My grandmother was still living at the time. She was 103 years old. Oh. I said, grandmother, I said, does anyone else in our family have cancer? She said, baby, not that I know of, but I'm going to do some research. So she started calling and talking to people to find out if they had cancer. But I was the one that felt like I had to be strong and that I felt like that my kids was not going to suffer because of this tragedy that happened to our family. I also felt that I always had to outwork any other nurse because I, because I was black, had to work, mm -hmm. out, work even harder because when when I went into some I did hospice for 18 years as well so when I went into someone's house and they were they didn't want anybody black and if I was the on-call nurse I answered the phone and the on the on the other end of the phone they would say and don't send those ends <sighs> to my house and I said sir I guarantee you that there won't be those ends that will be coming to your house and when I come up and I go knock 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 and they would be like oh and I, I know who I am. Mm -hmm. And we as black women have to know who we are, who we stand for, and not allow anybody else, I'm sorry, I get kind of uh, when I think about this, and not allow anybody to pour in our own spirit that we don't want. So whatever they say about us, and whatever they say that we are, or that, we, uh, that we are not, we can choose to say we are, that I am this, or I am not this. And we have to continue to be that I have to continue to take that stance. My last comment is one of the chancellors um, of the community college district here in, in California, I was in a meeting with him and he said, you know, Jeanette, he said, you know, there's gotta be someone that's willing to stick their neck out even if they know that their neck is gonna be chopped off. I said, well, you know what? I'm that person because I don't mind saying what I feel and I don't mind standing for what is right. And so that's why I talk to every student. I say hello to every student. They wonder, well, how come you're so nice? I said, that's not that I'm being nice. I'm just, you know, I'm just saying hello because that's how I was brought up. You don't come into the room and not say anything to anybody. You don't go into someone's house and only speak to the person that you want to visit, right? You say hello. You're, you're being cordial and you're being respectful. That's all I'm saying is that we have to be respectful and know who we are, who what we stand for, and that is the right thing to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. 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 I wanted to um, get your input on uh, how a community is essential for Black women and how, um, how a lack of community might impact us emotionally or psychologically, if you wanted any of you to share. I think because of the emotional labor that we have to deal with um, um, when we do when I think it's important not to off, off, offload that, but it's important to kind of, that's, that's why community is important for me. 
I need to be able to, I need a sounding board to know that, is it just me? Am I, am I like being outrageous? You know, is, 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 does this make sense? That sounding board is good. And I also think it's important for us to stress amongst each other. And I, I talked to this about, to, to this about my colleagues as well. Mental, because I know a stigma of mental health, it's so important to have that therapist. Every once in a while, just to be like the neutral part is like, you know, here's what it is. And every time when I go to, to my therapist, I just talk about work stuff. <laughs> like I'm trying to balance this, I'm trying to balance that. Like, how do I do this? How do I not feel that imposter syndrome? How do I, you know, navigate? Because for me, um, I realized I've been here for five years. I'm, I'm about to put my 10 year packet in, in December. And what I feel good about technically, what's my tenure packet and what I have to offer um, on paper, that feels good. But what I'm struggling with is, okay, well, what do I do next with this? Now that I've been awarded this, you know, this blessing, I've been able to do what so many other people have not been able to do. I can't just get tenure and do nothing. I can't just get tenure and sit and just be like, okay, well, that's great. But I made it to this, you know, like, so I'm really struggling with now um, how to take the next step. And there's, I found a couple of communities, like there's this whole Slack community. It's called, I think it's Slack, uh, this thread thing. And there's this one group called Sociology's Daughters of the Yam. And so I've had sociologists, black sociologists specifically across the country reach out, like one or, one or two reach out to me and, you know, we started this community and so we're kind of sharing advice with each other um helping each other out with the tenure process with with publications and and it was just when i saw this community you know and i, and I got invited to join it it's like this almost private sorority thing and mary i'm gonna have to get you in a loop at some point <laughs> if you're not on it um yeah but yes please you would it, it, it's amazing and i i was really able to kind of see how they were able to to kind of maintain their own lives and their own culture, which what makes them authentically themselves, and still try to um, you know present the information the best to uh, to the public. And so, I think that's that's kind of my answer. I think community is good, but I think we need to do a better job of making going to a therapist and acknowledging mental health issues. I think we need to do a better job of, of, of really kind of talking about that and not stigmatizing that. Absolutely. I, I felt part of the, I haven't lived in, in the black community. I was raised in South Central, then we moved to Carson. Then we, I, I live in Yucaipa now and we've been, we raised our children here for, you know, for various reasons, mainly having to do with my in-laws. Um, but I've always felt a part of the black community. I've always identified with the black community, even though I haven't physically lived in the black community for a long time. That's why I always look for my tribe wherever I go. Uh, and I think that's, that's really, really important. You know, you cannot, you cannot live, you know, the, the poem is no man is an island, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, are, we cannot live just independently. We need each other. We we are a uh, we are arguably I guess one of the most vilified groups in the world, right? Since 1619, uh, African Americans uh, have been uh, placed at the bottom of everything. And, and I can say that even sitting here as you use the term you use, Aniko, is privilege. You know, we're, we're privileged for, for being where we are right now. Nevertheless, you know, there, we, you, you guys know you can go in some black communities and you feel like you're in a foreign country. The kids barely speak English. Uh, the, the boys are standing out on the corner because they, they don't have any jobs. They, they, they disappear when the, the police come around the corner, you know, so are, are we going to be satisfied living in our nice little cocoons or are, what are we going to do to prevent the kinds of things that we began this conversation with, you know, the, the fact that, that uh, we are victims of the pandemic more than any other group because doctors still believe, they don't believe us. 
you know, the, read Serena Williams' uh, uh, harrowing uh, ordeal after she gave birth. And she's got money. But the, she kept saying something is wrong. Something is wrong. And I think they finally found, you know, blood clots that would have killed her if she had not insisted that they run more tests. Uh, you know, they uh, a, a new study just showed that doctors doctors feel like African Americans have a higher tolerance for pain than other people. <laughs> yes, yes. So yeah. they don't they don't treat us with the proper medication, um, and so it's it's at everywhere you turn around, whether it's the corner grocery store or or Kaiser at a doctor's office. You know, you are going to be mistrusted, uh, n not believed. And, and, and it's, it's up to us to, uh, as, as the intellectuals, what, what Du Bois call the talented 10th, you know, it's up to us to change systems, to change the way people police us, the way they teach us. You know, my brothers walked into classrooms where the teachers did not, I mean, they hated to have them in those classrooms. That's how they treat young black boys. You know, and you wonder why they drop out. You wonder why they don't make good grades because 86% uh, of the people who are teaching our kids K through 12 are white women who bring their own racist agenda into that classroom. So it, it is, it is, it, we owe the community. The community made us and we owe the community something back. And I'm talking to you, Miss Yvette, as you're starting out your, your what what is your what what are you what you want to do with your degree communications and minor minoring in environmental science Fantastic. and you do political speech writing after yeah. Yeah. i get my degree that's fantastic i tell students whatever field you want to go into you can be an activist i don't care if it's art or uh, music or environmental studies, you know, there's, a, there's something called environmental racism. And my, my professor, um, um, uh, Robert Bullard, uh, he began the whole conversation about environmental racism. So he's got a sociology degree, right? Robert Bullard? Robert Bullard, yeah, he was my mentor at, uh, at, at UCR. And, and he, he saw in his community, the Fifth Ward in Houston, that they were dumping in his neighborhood and he he made the connection between a weak neighborhood and the likelihood that you will get uh you will get a toxic incinerator in your neighborhood you'll get pig farms in your neighborhood whatever it is and it adversely affects the the uh the uh the health of uh of people in the community he started that conversation 30 years ago 30 years ago. So we can do what, you know, whatever it's like Booker T. Washington said, wherever you are, drop that bucket right there and clean, clean it. You know, he meant something else, but I, I'm, I, I took it <laughs> in a different direction, but yeah, you know, we, we have to, and we've got to, we've got to build that fire under all of our kids. Anika, you can be an activist in the classroom. You know, your, your community service. I have sent kids out on service, uh, you know, for, for credit. And, and they, they can see racism at work in the community, in the community. So we professors, we college professors, we college counselors, we have a lot of power. We have a lot of power. And, and we can use that for good or not. And I've chosen to do it, to use it for good. I know some students are uncomfortable with that. It's like, you know, well, I just want to take this class. I just want to do what yeah. I got to do. Do I really got to be an activist? You know, do I have to do, 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 do? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I, um, I've been trying to include more service learning stuff in my class, but at the, at the same time, like, well, what's the point of me teaching you if at the end of the, this, the quarter or the semester, I don't give you some avenues, some tools to go out and be uh -huh. activists and, and make some change. Like, what's the point of you learning all this stuff? And I'm not saying everyone has to, but I feel like I have to at least present the option uh -huh. of what you can uh -huh. do. Uh -huh. So, so I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
I always tell students, my job is not to make you comfortable. <laughs> my job is to make you uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you know, because so, some of us are sitting and, you know, we're just thinking about those grades and those tests and everything, but you've right. got to shake things up. You've got to shake things up and, and, see, and show them the world that nobody wants them to see. You know, that, that uh, you know, people are shocked that this man got a knee in his, in his neck. And, and, and that's because they've had their eyes closed. I'm not talking about black folks, we know. But, but, uh, but so many others don't realize how, how we're treated by teachers, by social workers, by cops, all those people who don't live in our communities they come into our communities to, to quote unquote, teach us how to live. And, you know, we know how to live. We have survived. Mm -hmm. Since you did bring up um, the events uh, around George Floyd and there have been um, more and more protests spreading out across the country, I wanted you all to touch on the fact that in the black community, there is um, a widespread emotional unrest and how maybe, and how um, the perceptions of others not in our community are blowing back on us. I was talking to my mom um, this, you know, cause you, you know, after they, I told you my family came here, we had dinner. Um, and it took me a little while. I mean, I just had to, I had to like digest all of it. And then I started thinking about other incidences, you know, where, you know, where, um, you know, the, the, thinking about lynching in the past. And so the, both the incident with um, that woman in um, Central Park and, and, and this incident, both of those just made me think about, you know, this idea that some people say, well, oh, we're, racism doesn't exist and all, all this other stuff or or that's what my father did or my grandfather's did or or you know slavery or something in your in your parents background and I'm like with all that I know and all I've read you, you know and currently teaching race ethnicity right now it's just history repeating itself like it's like nothing has changed I mean some things have changed but it's like but a lot hasn't and mm -hmm. it's frustrating that some people don't seem to under I feel like if you don't have that knowledge of where we've come from, you don't really fully understand that this is just repeating itself. And then it makes sense why we're so angry. So this idea that, oh, you, you've got opportunities now. I mean, you know, think we had a black president, we had all this other stuff. Things have changed. I'm mean, like, I, like, we really wish they did. We really wish they did change. And if things have changed, then we wouldn't be protesting. We wouldn't be complaining. Because they're like, oh, you're just complaining about things. You don't not satisfied with things have changed. It's like, well, no, things haven't. And it's just another, it's just another indicator for me that things have not changed. And I just, you know, really wish that everyone was, it's a terrible thing to say, but forced to take these classes where they knew the history so they could have a better understanding of why things are happening now. And as you said, Mary, we're not surprised by this happening because we already know this is our legacy. This is our history. This is, this is what it is. But again, it gets back to why are we angry? Because the law says one thing, it says that we have, you know, we have all these, these laws in terms of fair housing, we we're all have equal, equal opportunities to get an education, equal opportunities to um, get housing wherever we want to live, and all these other things have changed on the, you know, legally, but then in reality, it's not so much. And so that's really, really frustrating. It's like if, if change the laws and change the policies are where things are supposed to be, and that's the ultimate way for us to change society, and that and that and that doesn't work, then what else are we supposed to do? You burn the police station down. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> this is on tape. I didn't mean that. I really, literally, not literally burn it down. But you know, you you've got ex felons who are coming out of out of prison. And can't even and can't even stay in public housing. You know, let's let's start there. Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 what does that lead them to do? It leads them to steal, 
to get, to go right back into that old lifestyle because we can't even support them to give them a place to live until they can get on their feet. Right? So there, it, it's, it's a huge, huge problem. And, and it's not like we've been sitting around for 400 years uh, and, and twiddling our thumbs. Right. We have been active uh, for 400 years. Uh, over 200 slave rebellions. They don't teach you that in school. 200 slave rebellions. Uh, calling for reparations. Almost immediately after the Civil War, there was, a, a, you know, court battles about reparations. I don't need no reparations, but there are some communities that do. They need a better education system. They need a better healthcare system. They need all of these things that they didn't get uh, at the end of the Civil War, at the end of slavery. And so it's like when you walk into these communities, it's like you're walking into, you know, the 19th century. Interesting, because I was sitting here thinking when, when you say blowback, um, who is that? Uh, what do you mean by blowback? And the people that don't look like us? Yes. Okay. Um, because one of the things that I, I, I talked about and, and I think about is the fact that um, that Black people have a legacy of intergenerational trauma mm -hmm. from uh, unrelenting violence. So, and it continues over and over and on and on. And I think that a lot of those people that give the blowback, they look through a different lens than the reality that we live every day. So they don't see things because they don't experience it the way we experience it. And, um, you know, it makes me think about uh, my family. Um, I was raised, uh, my primary growth and raised was in the Twin Cities. My family is in mm -hmm. the Twin Cities. And my mother's here with us in California and she's constantly on the phone with my family back there, my brothers, her, her nieces, I mean, her nephews, and that level of worry. And um, when I was talking to my friend, they're like, why does she worry? She's here <laughs> and she's not there, but her blackness is here. Mm -hmm. It's with us all the time. Our experiences with every time I leave the house, she worries about me as her daughter. Every time anyone leaves the house, um, they worry. Um, I don't have to condone uh, certain things, but I understand it. Uh, whether I condone the looting or the riots or, or whether or not, I understand that level of frustration and that level of anger, that level of not being heard, um, not having change happen, and that frustration of how we get it to happen when we trust people that they're going to come in and help us and they don't. Um, you know, I, I understand that. I think a lot of it comes from when I talk to my white friends um, and they call me on a constant, you know, I'm just checking in to see how you're doing. I'm like, that's fine and good, but what are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, I, it, it's not just a me problem, a us problem. This is a we problem. And um, some of them didn't really realize it. They didn't understand it. Um, they didn't see it, uh, mostly because they didn't want to. They, they didn't want to because that would have to make them face the reality of the ugly, ugliness of the world in which we live. And they are part of that and they don't want to face it. So it's easier to turn a blind eye or pretend or ignore that it's, it's happening. Um, the incident in Minnesota was not the first incident. Where were you when it was happening all those times before? Where was the outcry before? Uh, for my people, it's always been there, that frustration, that experience. Um, so, you know, I think that to some degree, the, the blowback is, is, is sheer ignorance um, and just being ill-informed. And so the question becomes, okay, how do you um, reach out to those people? I, I was looking on Facebook and I try not to go on social media very often, but I, I was listening to this, this, this white woman um, who said that all of this time that I have ignored and denied racism, it took me to see this, to realize that it exists. So where has she been living all this time? Mm -hmm. where, where has she been? 
but it took her this moment. And I guess, am I supposed to be grateful? I guess that the realization came to her in this moment. Um, and maybe she'll make a difference or do something different. I don't know. But I know that there are a lot of people just like her that are out there. Mm -hmm. there and, and what do we do as a community, as a people? Um, you know, I, I ask myself, you know, I'm here in California and my family's back in the Twin Cities. And it's not that we don't have issues or concern. Uh, it was my understanding that there was a protest not too far from San Bernardino, I mean, in San Bernardino mm -hmm. uh, last mm -hmm. night. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to make sure that I'm doing what I need to do um, as an advocate uh, to make a difference and make a change. I mean, even I'm asking my own self that question. Um, what is it that I can do and what can I do more of? Even on the campus, um, I, I'm listening to my colleagues here talk about the activism that they're doing on the campus. Most of you have been on campus more than I have. I've only been on this campus for two and a half um, years. And in my field at CAPS, Counseling and Psychological Services, a lot of it is done uh, very confidential. So um, you don't see my face out on campus as often. I only come to events. And so when you were talking before about community and I'm thinking about what I feel with my clients, um, that need of being able to talk to someone who looks like them, being able to relate because there is that concern of cultural differences of not talking to an African-American therapist that they may not be understood. Their experiences won't um, be relatable to someone that does not look like them. The importance on campus of, I love the fact that you speak and say hello to um, all the African-Americans that you see on campus because I know that there are many of them that don't feel that connection mm -hmm. with the African-American community on the campus. Um, they feel that there's a disconnect um, because there's only so many of us, so they don't see themselves very often. Um, and I personally, you know, I'm trying to figure out for my own self, what can I do in that community, um, not just in general as a whole, but the community at the campus, um, to be able to bridge that gap where um, I can be more involved and that I can, um, especially with our African-American women, because in my encounters, they don't feel connected on campus. They don't feel supported on campus. How can we bridge that gap uh, with them to be able to get that kind of support and encouragement um, that they need? Because it sounds like it's there. It just sounds like I'm not tapping into it to be able to help them connect with it. So I'm hoping once I leave here that this will be an opportunity for me to connect with, you know, my sisters who are obviously so strong and, um, you know, well knowledgeable in so many ways where I can, you know, extend that help uh, to them as well and then be a part of the uh, this community, you know, as well. So I know I talked about two things all at once, but, um, you know, I think that a lot of it, and we, we say it, and sometimes I think I get tired of saying it, knowledge is power, but you'd be amazed at how many people are just not knowledgeable about these kind of things. I see it every day in my job, just the basic of things that they just don't know. And how do we create that level of knowledge um, to um, aid them and to be able to understand not just the world around them, but to understand themselves, um, to love themselves, um, to think that they're good, they're beautiful, they're worthy, all of those things. Um, I, I see that in our uh, Black women. They don't think they're beautiful. They don't think they're attractive. They don't think that they're smart enough, good enough. Um, how do we help them to create that place and confidence with themselves to say that, yes, you are worthy, um, you are great, and that you can do and be anything and all things that you want to be. Um, and that's right there in our, in, on campus. So if, if I can tap into your knowledge, your experience, your expertise, um, to be able to help 
you know, our young African American women and the African Americans on campus to be able to be that, um, that would be wonderful. Um, can I ask a question? Um, are, are you uh, in uh, the counseling services? Are, are you the first African American to be in counseling services? I, so am, I think you are, Hattie. I think you are. I think years ago they had a trainee Ugh. that was an African American female. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think since mm -hmm. then, um, I'm the first African American female, um, especially licensed now, female there. Wow. And then we wow. have Tavon. He is um, the only African American male that they've ever had, for sure. Well, that's a, that's a lot of progress because I've had many students come and say, I need to go, you know, I'm feeling suicidal or whatever. And, uh, and, and I, need, I need to see a black, I want to see a black counselor. And I, I couldn't say anything, so I right. sent them. I sent them to Jeff Tan, you know, who is, who is a really cool guy, mm -hmm. but he's not black. You know, he's he's a person of color, but he's not black. Right. I mean, he's a so person of color, but he's not black. It, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, so it's really good to see. And I'm the, my follow up is: Would you be willing to be part of a panel? Uh, because we just happen to be looking for a counselor. Uh, on the incidents in uh, the, you know, the various police incidents uh, that have occurred. And I think the date is like June the 3rd. Uh, is that so Wednesday? I, I don't know. I, yes. I, I, I can, uh, can I submit your name? Um, absolutely. We were actually just in a meeting uh, for our uh, staff meeting and that oh. was brought up. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, that you were looking for someone and I yes. was going yes. to actually reach out. Oh, good. So, so I'll, absolutely. I'll, I'll give Jeremy your name then. Jeremy okay. Murray is the historian who is who is um, coordinating all of this. It looks like it's going to be a pretty good panel. So okay. I'll have him reach out to you. And you're just uh, your uh, H McNutt at CSUSB. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I'll have him McNutt? reach yes. out to you then and uh, and and and. Um, Put you on the put you on the panel. He's put together the flyer. It's a very nice flyer, uh, and uh, and all of us who are going to be speaking. So I'll definitely. I mean, I just think this was uh, this was fate that we would get together. And just as I'm getting Jeremy's um, flyer, and the the place for counselor is blocked out because we didn't have a name. So okay. I will definitely okay. give him your name. Excellent. Excellent. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Eva. Did we go off topic there? No, no, no. It's all right. <laughs> uh, we are going to be closing roughly in uh, 10 minutes. Jeanette, did you have a, a question that you wanted to ask? And I, I have one as well. I do. Um, just really quick. How do you, how do you all feel where Yvette and I can be of a bigger voice um, in our student population, our student community, to help our African American women and young men because they look at us as well. So, what do you feel? Or how do you feel that we could be a better service to them? You're 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 um, you're muted, Anika. You're muted. Oh, I'm so yeah, muted. There you go. <laughs> I think. As a start, um, there's so many resources on campus and there are faculty and, you know, um, in, some, in some ways you do have to kind of strategically look and say, okay, well, who in what department can I talk to who are not as out there or as vocal, but who are still willing to help? So I think that as long as you, as, as students, as you come across these resources, or them on to other students. Um, and as, as you come across mentors or people who they could talk to, let them know that, you know, I know that this person might be willing to help. Um, I think that, you know, again, it's, it is a lot of work for us because not there's not that many of us on campus, but I'd rather do the work. I'd rather do the work than find that our students fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. I really would. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's just important to kind of pass on those contacts to them and say, here, I know someone who you can talk to. I know this organization you can be a part of um, so that they feel like they have a little bit more control of their situation because 
it, it's alarming to me, Mary, that you say that there's been so many students who were suicidal and all these other things, mm -hmm. and they did not find someone that they can talk to and identify mm -hmm. with. And that would have made a difference in terms of their mental health. So um, getting that out, I think is important. Yes. I, and, I, and if I may, I, I just, I think what we're doing right now, I have met three remarkable women just in this short time. And I think if you all can put together, I, I, I'm there for you. If you wanna to put together a panel on, on black women students, and I've, I've spoken in person to black women students, but this pandemic, there may be something good coming out of this because I didn't have to dress up. I didn't have to get in my car. I didn't have to drive any place, you know? So, you know, and, and I know a lot of us are going to be free in the summertime and I am, so willing to be a part of a panel that will meet young black women, find out what their dreams and hopes are, what find out what their fears are, and just to get to know them. You know, it can be like a potluck or something, or not a potluck, but you know, a, uh, and not a cocktail hour, but I guess lunch or something. Uh, but we can, you know, we can certainly get together. You know, Zoom can accommodate 300 people. Right. So let's do that. I, I am so willing to, to, to be in front of my computer and to answer questions for young black women, uh, to, um, to lift as I climb. Uh, and and, uh, and I, I just think, and it's, it, it seems like it's fairly easy to do. We don't have to rent a room or a space or anything. Zoom is free. This is a great opportunity, great opportunity. For us to, to get together and, and to meet. I, I was just in another meeting, the, the Black Town Hall meeting, and I saw so many faces. I mean, there must have been 40 people in that group, 40 mm -hmm. people. And they, most of them were students, and they were wonderful. They were wonderful, and they just need some direction. They're anxious. They want to do something. They want to do something. I think sometimes, you know, we can go to the president and say, we want the cops to, to, uh, to stop doing this. But I think sometimes we need, to, we need to use our feet and demonstrate. And I think our students, you know, sometimes all they need to hear is, okay, we'll meet you in front of the administration building at two o'clock today. Boom. You know, not that I want to start any trouble or anything on campus. I've been on a, in a lot of demonstrations on and off campus. But I think sometimes bodies and numbers make a difference. They yeah. do. They make a difference. So I'm, I'm willing to do anything, anything. You just, you say, just point me in the right direction and I will be there. I, I just want to say really quickly, one of the things that would really, I think would be great um, because there's such a stigma with mental health is um, being able to promote um, our services. And I, I would love to sit down with, with both of you and um, share what it is that we do. Because the reality is, I think a lot of students, especially our African American uh, students, uh, don't realize that you can come and seek psychological services, come in for counseling. It, it could just be one time. If you just feel in a certain kind of way and you just want someone uh, yes. to listen and to talk to, um, that they can come and talk to us. And they can also um, actually request an African-American therapist. They don't have to just take anyone. They can mm -hmm. say, I would like Good. to speak to Hattie. Mm -hmm. I would like mm -hmm. to speak to uh, Tavon. And then another thing is that sometimes, and Tavon and I was talking, especially with everything that's happening, um, if, they, if you wanted to create an event that is just a roundtable discussion, Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to have the term psychological services attached mm -hmm. to it. They just want to come and talk that we can be a part of that. Um, so beautiful. we're very open and he and I want to be out there and mm -hmm. we definitely want to be engaged and involved with the African-American community. Um, so uh, utilize us yes, um, yeah. uh, as a Good. service. We're here. Good. Can I ask you a question, Hattie? Just, I, yeah. I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm uh, interrupting, but uh, I have heard different, uh, number of hours uh, for students to be a part of to get counseling can you mm -hmm. tell me exactly what the guidelines are how, how much counseling can they get um, we are a short-term model but we don't attach a number to that oh. we meet our students where they are 
and we provide them with the services that they need. And then we have, uh, um, our director has really uh, been really great about allowing us to manage our um, schedules um, as long as we, and we don't have a wait list. So um, I see clients that come in, I may see them just one time, a three time on average, we see our clients six to seven time, but then we do have some clients that are a little bit more long-term. So oh, we so don't you, like you don't to limit. put a number. Yeah. yeah, we don't put a number on it. I think in the past, um, there was a 12 session limit per um, academic per year. year. Uh, year. Right, yes. and yeah. Yeah. we don't really work necessarily. Uh, she's kind of taken away a number uh, to give us That's more great. freedom as professionals to manage our, our time. Love it, love it, thank you. I was just gonna say that, you know, um, eventually when this whole stuff blows over, I, it would be nice to have some kind of a luncheon. Like a little mini luncheon where we just, you know, break bread and just have an informal kind of conversation with students and other faculty and staff about this kind of stuff and of building community. But I also wanted to, you know, just thank Mary too for all of, you know, her activism and all of the things that she's done over the, the, the course of, you know, her career here. Because every once in a while, people are like, oh, you know, people say, oh, you know, they say to me, oh, you remind me of of, of Mary a little bit. I'm like, that is a huge compliment. Oh, man. Yeah, it could be worse. <laughs> could be worse. <laughs> Those, I, I know. I know. Because, I'm a rab- because you're a rabble rouse. I know. <laughs> but I'm like, that's a huge compliment. compliment and there's some really big shoes to fill. Thank um, you, Nika. And, I appreciate and, it. And I'm just starting along. And these are things that I can kind of do, more of the things I can do after I get tenure. And mm-hmm. so... Definitely. Um, so, so the things I'm waiting, I'm holding on. Like, oh, I can do it. You know, it's gonna happen a little bit later on. But you know, it, it does make me feel inspired and encouraged about what's happening next. And of course, I was sad and upset that she had to FERP. You know, like how dare her FERP and stuff. But then I realized it's like, okay, well, you know, I can't. You know, Mary needs to do what Mary's do, and she, mm-hmm. and because she's done all the things that she has for the community, it makes sense that. You know, she kind of goes on to the next kind of phase of what what's next. But I got I was, two more years to to to, to raise hell, so don't don't don't, don't write me off just yet. <laughs> Good, I'm around two more years. We, we got you. We got you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anika. Thank you, Mary. I have to run, um, unfortunately, but yeah, we are you going to be at the graduation? Wait, when's that? That's at two o'clock today. If you can't make the one today, uh, we're going to have one also. You guys know about that? Where we're going to, um, uh, we're going to put on our regalia, even if it's just the hat, and we're going to tape in a Zoom session a congratulations to the Black students who are graduating. So that's happening at two o'clock today. But uh, I'll send you I'll send you the information for next week also because uh, we know a lot of people are either teaching or otherwise engaged uh, at two o'clock today. So I'll I'll give you the the rest of the information. In Thanks. in fact in fact what you can do is contact um, uh, or Evelyn Evelyn Knox. Uh, Evelyn has uh, she's she will give you the Zoom link for next week if you can, but you know, we're trying to get as many people as we can to put on our regalia. Uh, that's gonna be the first phase is putting on regalia, t- taping, congratulations. And then the second phase is we're going to have a caravan of cars picking up boxes with kinte cloth and certificates and something else. One more thing. Um, but we're going to we're going to put those boxes together for students so that they can uh, pick them up at the end of uh, June. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So we hope you guys will will join us. We are at time for our discussion, and I wanted to thank all of the panelists for your contributions and for participating in this discussion. Um, we really appreciated everything you had to say and the insights you had to bring to the table. And with that, did any of you have any closing remarks you wanted to make? Just get crazy. <laughs> Just, you have to get crazy. You have to get crazy. Uh, even though people call you crazy, you know you're not crazy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, this, these are desperate times. 
desperate times. And I just want to give everybody permission to get crazy. That's all. Not that you need my permission, but, and thank you so much for putting this together, Yvette. It's very, yes, very thank nice. you. Very, thank very you nice. very much. Yes. Yeah. And I'll see you all. I know I'll see you all again. I know Absolutely. I will. Yes, Absolutely. Yes.